this one. Thanks, Keith. Thanks, Keith. Um, as Keith uh, said, my name is Gavin, Gavin Young from Cable and Wireless, and, wireless. and we're here to talk here about to talk the work of the Broadband Forum, 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 forum uh, which covers uh, which quite a wide area. So today, given that we've only got about 30 minutes for this, I'm just going to focus, just focus on next generation, generation access. access. So I'll, so I'll give an overview of the forum, forum talk about talk some about of the drivers for next generation access, access, then some of the architectural the work at the Broadband the Forum, forum uh, next, uh, next generation access, access customer premise customer equipment, premise and what the forum is doing on management of that, that. Uh, and, uh, and then summarise some, some, some of the specifications and some of the roadmap uh, direction. direction. So at the Broadband so Forum, this, this, this um, is an organisation, uh, a global organisation uh, made up of about 210, 210 uh, companies, uh, companies, a mixture of operators and vendors, uh, systems uh, vendors, system chipset vendors, 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 vendors um, operators, operators uh, from, from Asia, Asia North, America, North America and Europe. And Europe. Um, um, th there's also there's some also academic some institutions, institutions, research institutes, institutes and uh, interestingly uh, regulators. Ofcom are a member and have been very active in the last three meetings. So they see the Broadband Forum is driving some of the standards that they want to get more competitive uh, uh, access in the UK. Uh, so what it does uh, so is it produce does technical, uh, technical uh, reports, uh, reports technical, technical specifications, specifications that cover uh, uh, entire kind of broadband network, 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 network issues and associated issues management. management. Uh, Pre it was in a previous was in life known as the DSL, DSL Forum, Forum, but after two but years after working two years on fiber and YMAX and, 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 and other bits and pieces, the name no longer fit in, so it changed, it changed the Broadband Forum. Broadband uh, forum. Uh, and last uh, year, some of the IPM and PLS Forum guys also joined. Uh, actually, uh, actually, this actually is, this uh, is uh, right, okay. Okay. right, okay. In PowerPoint, there's PowerPoint, a whole bunch of hidden, bunch hidden slides. slides. If, if I slides, skip through some slides, slides, that's because, because I was giving you the full, set, the full set to take away, take but when I come, when I come to present, I will be diving through this. I'm only actually presenting on the subset. We'll never get through this in 30 minutes. That was my Confuse me there. So some of the drivers for next generation access. A lot of access networks, to be honest, are a complete mess with a huge range of technologies, be that delivered over fibre, over the radio, ether, copper, coax, whatever. There's a huge amount of technologies out there. And covering everything from frame relay, ATM, IP networks, etc., TDM. So really, the goal of a lot of is to rationalise that, to rationalize that. Uh, and if you're, uh, if you're to summarise what they're trying to do in two words, words it would be more broadband, broadband, broadband and more Ethernet. Ethernet. Uh, basically, uh, to basically reduce the options, reduce the, options, reduce the cost and increase the speed. And a lot of people are trying to focus on Ethernet as a kind of base currency that you could deliver any service over instead of having vertically integrated silos of services with bespoke access. And obviously, once you've got that, you've got an IPM, LS, LTTP, whatever you want over the top of it. Uh, so in, uh, in terms so of the, the, terms evolution, the evolution, we've seen obviously people obviously wanting more, more cost-effective cost bandwidth and transport, and transport. Uh, faster, uh, faster interconnects, quite and, and 10 gig internet, 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 internet interconnects between operators, operators. increasing use of fibre, um, but obviously to but obviously increase, increase speed, speed, but also to reduce also OPEX, OPEX, particularly if you take fibre all the way to the home, although it costs you an arm length to dig up roads to do that, once you get there your OPEX is a lot lower than having electronics on the street or old copper networks that drive a lot of OPEX. And also people and also want people them to be easy to integrate easy to with existing broadband existing infrastructures that they've deployed, um, predominantly around DSL. So, DSL. so if you look at broadband, broadband globally today, today, we're on our way, I'm not sure if we just reached the 500 million mark of broadband, broadband lines. lines. Uh, something like 65% of those are, those are DSL, but uh, increasingly uh, fibre. Uh, and those uh, are defined a lot of architectures people are working with already. Uh, from a regulatory, uh, from a regulatory perspective, perspective, in order to give competitive, competitive access to that infrastructure, infrastructure um, um, regulators like Ofcom are looking at passive line passive access, which is unbundled duct to fibre, fiber, that sort of approach. And that's, and that's outside, outside the scope of the broadband forum. But also they're, also they're looking at something called active, active line access, access, which is a kind of Ethernet bitstream access. access. Um, and, and we'll touch on that today. In terms of requirements, requirements for next-generation next generation access, access networks, networks, if you look at you functionality, functionality, Ofcom defined five, five pillars of functionality in next-generation next access, access, which is quality of service, quality security, security multicast, multicast, flexible control, control and choice management of CPE, and flexible choice of interconnect. interconnect. 
Uh, but other uh, important other requirements are the ability to integrate cost effectively with existing broadband infrastructure, a standardised uh, approach. approach. Um, we're likely to see um, local, local monopolies, monopolies um, um, in the way that we have a patchwork of cable, cable franchises in this country. In this country. Um, you're not um, going to get not three or four operators four digging up the same streets to take fibre to your house. It's going to be a lot of patchwork quilt. So the cost of integration is integrated with all those different infrastructure providers. You want some degree of standardisation. But at the same time, the same as a service time, provider, you want to differentiate. So ideally, so you ideally want to buy a layer two, two, service, two service, service, you can do whatever you like in terms of the IP layer involved. Uh, and also, uh, it needs to be future proof, it needs to be conscious of developments like IPv6, WDM, and so on. So that's some of the drivers so around, the drivers you know, around you know, uh, setting the direction uh, for the next generation, generation access. access. Now let's look at now some of the broadband the forum, forum work. work and, work and uh, first and of all, in the architecture, first of the architecture area. area. Um, why um, why standardise the architecture? Standardize the architecture? Well, well, it's really to shape really the broadband, shape broadband evolution so that all the stakeholders in the, in the chain, in the chain uh, uh, you know, vendors, uh, operators, etc., can have their say. Also to promote interoperability, architectures are made up of access, aggregation, core networks, and it's all got to work end to end. Quality of service, uh, quality multicast, etc. Work, work, work end to end, uh, and, and you want an uh, open want infrastructure, infrastructure if you're going to get, um, get um, new service new providers service come on board and, and, use, that. and use that. So if we look at the so look history at the of architecture in the broadband, broadband forum, forum, it started off in, in, in 1999. There's a technical, a technical report, report uh, 25, uh, 25 that basically that all that did was uh, an end-to-end -end uh, architecture, ATM-based broadband architecture for ATM in the early days, purely for best effort internet access. It then moved then on moved uh, a few years later, uh, years later to, uh, explain uh, to explain how you best use quality of service on the ATM broadband, ATM broadband networks. networks. So we were looking so at things like uh, something like called BLEZ, uh, broadband, broadband, broadband loop emulation, emulation service, service uh, which is you know, uh, which is, you know uh, voice, uh, voice uh, over ATM, uh, over ATM on top of these sort of broadband networks. But the real change came in 2006 when we moved to Ethernet architectures. So TR101 was the kind of landmark architecture there. That enabled people to move from uh, STM1 backhaul, which was typically a congestion point from the DSLAM in a lot of broadband networks, and to upgrade to GIG E, uh, which is what we did in the, in the cable and wireless infrastructure. Uh, some folks, uh, some for some, folks, unknown, for some unknown, reason, unknown reason, chose to move to Ethernet, to Ethernet but only put 100 meg back all in, and pretty in, soon those networks were flatlining, flat and they've had to and subsequently move to GIGI. But, uh, but, uh, but the real uh, transition, transition was that move from ATM to Ethernet. To Ethernet. Um, initially, um, initially, that focused, initially that focused on broadband architectures with DSL tails, and then last year we delivered TR156, which is basically how you fit passive optical network access into that same Ethernet architecture. So that's kind of the state of the art at the moment. A lot of network Built works built in the last few years and followed those years, architectures, those certainly cable and wireless has and a number of others in the UK. Uh, current work uh, current is now work is focused now on something, on working text 145, that's a work in progress, is looking at uh, deeper MPLS, uh, MPLS uh, into those uh, aggregation into networks, networks and into access and into nodes. Access nodes. Um, um, operators like Deutsche Telekom, France Telecom are particularly keen on driving that. Oops, something's gone wrong with the slides there. What's happened, there. what's happened there, so I can't talk I you can't through, the talk through the reference model, but anyway, the basically the TR101 uh, architecture is, is broken is down into customer down premises where we've defined the requirements, requirements or residential or gateways, DSL routers, routers, routers and so on, the access node, the DSLAMs, MSANs, the aggregation network, and then you get into your broadband network gateways, your BNGs and VRASs, and then how you hand off to ISPs. So typically the hand off to ISPs is been, uh, been uh, L2TP, LTTP, I guess many people are familiar, familiar, familiar with that, uh, and something uh, called IP Quas, um, um, which uh, again is something uh, again, Cable and Wireless have offered. Wireless uh, offered. Uh, the ISP uh, doesn't the ISP pay for LNSs, LNSs in, that, in, that in that situation. There is also there is an also Ethernet Interconnect that's designed, that's designed, defined for lower volume, volume business volume services, and again, like the Cable and Wireless Network, we use that internally for the access platform to interconnect into our multi service platform to deliver VPNs to our customers. So, apologies, something's wrong with the graphics there, but I think in the slides yeah, the that you've slides got, I think you get a copy of these, you should be able to see that reference model uh, in, in all its glory. Um, so some um, of the, the so features the of that features architecture, of that architecture are, protocol are protocol adaptation. So, um, so um, ADSL, ADSL and ADSL2 Plus were defined many years ago. They have an ATM layer 2 over the copper. So when you've got GIGI back all, you need an interworking function to convert PPPOA to PPOE, etc. There's security features in there to protect against MAC address spoofing, DOS attacks, etc. 
etc. Et um, access um, loop access identification. Loop identification. Uh, a lot of uh, operators, lot of operators uh, use the, the uh, fact that you can uh, have an intermediate agent that tells you the, the sync rate of the end user's line, the actual line ID, dashboard ID, etc. Passing that through to your BRAS or your BNG. That's information a lot of operations teams use. And then end to end Ethernet OAM is covered in there as well. Uh, in addition, uh, in it, covers addition it covers a whole bunch of stuff on multicast. I won't go through the detail, go through the detail uh, here now. It talks about how IGMP V3 can work, how uh, snooping works, how the multicast is controlled, blacklist, whitelist, etc. Um, so it's a really, um, so really, that TR101 architecture, architecture was a blueprint, was a blueprint of how you do end-to-end -end was and end-to-end -end -end multicast in an Ethernet-based Ethernet broadband, broadband network. 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 Uh, things like uh, hierarchical things like scheduling like in there scheduling and how they, that, that works on the BNG to, to control quads for end users was, was also covered. Uh, and how this uh, interacts with the radius. Um, and, um, the, and the, the, the format the of these format architecture, of these architecture uh, technical reports technical is to specify the functional requirements, the nodal requirements for the different elements of the network. So the access so node, the DSLANs, uh, MSANs, etc., et et functionality there, there. Aggregation, aggregation switches, switches uh, broadband network broadband gateways, gateways uh, and not shown uh, on there is the broadband residential gateway and customer premise. They're the four main entities of which the functional requirements are designed. And the idea is an operator can use those in RFPs, get out the tender, and know that you can stitch the slots together and deliver that end to end causal multicast. Uh, and within uh, that and within architecture, that it covers um, um, both um, uh, uh, VLAN, uh, VLAN per service and VLAN, VLAN per subscriber per models, uh, models, sometimes uh, known as end to one and one to one VLAN mapping. Uh, and, and you can uh, actually run both together. So, in, in the cable and wireless platform, for example, we'll have a, uh, a VLAN per subscriber for the unicast traffic, internet access, VOD, etc. And an end to one VLAN for the multicast, the IPTV multicast that we deliver. So, you can mix those. Um, um, okay, I'll skip through that. Skip through um, that. Now, what, um, we, uh, what we found uh, is when we, found delivered, this we delivered this architecture, a lot of operators have put in complete end-to-end -end end broadband, broadband infrastructure, both from a network, network perspective, perspective core and aggregation, and aggregation uh, from a systems uh, from perspective, a systems and, perspective, perspective and, from a and from a process perspective. perspective. And, when came to, and when it came to uh, improving, uh, improving the speed of their access, they didn't want to throw all that away and start again. They wanted to simply bolt on different access tails into that existing broadband infrastructure. So, for example, they wanted to look at GPON 5. Fiber access, fiber access, fiber to the cabinet fiber with VDSL2, the cabinet, VDSL2 uh, from the cabinet uh, to the home, to the home. Uh, bonded DSL, uh, bonded DSL uh, using multiple, uh, copper, using multiple lines. copper lines. So the idea was the to idea was use to the existing TL1 architecture, but to just be able to bolt in different high-speed high speed tiles. High speed tiles. And for some of those, you bonded DSL, DSL and VDSL, VDSL or whatever, that, that was reasonably that straightforward. Was really straightforward. Uh, but for GPON, uh, but that was uh, that a bit was more of a challenge. A challenge. Uh, so we did uh, some work, so did some uh, this work, one's come out all right, where, where, um, where so this is the, so basically this is the, the TL101 architecture, architecture, but with the DSL, with the DSL elements DSL replaced by GPON elements. We've got an optical line transmission system, the optical distribution network, which is fiber is in the ground, and the optical network unit in the customer premises that terminates that fiber transmission. All the rest of this is the rest standard TR101 architecture, architecture with your aggregation, your BNGs, BNGs, your IP cores. because GPON, first of all, the ITU specs came with a huge amount of options for doing TDM, ATM, as well as Ethernet. Uh, and they left too many options open because of the standards battles that happened there. So the Broadband fo Forum in intentionally made some decisions on some of those op options and was more prescriptive. Uh, but also GPON has got a, a whole range of mechanisms for doing quas and traffic isolations. You get into things like T-cons, so traffic containers, where there's different types there for delivering different quality of service. Uh, gem ports, um, generic uh, encapsulation mode, and all these things had to be mapped into VLAN uh, uh, tools and techniques to get it to work end to end. Uh, so that was delivered as part of the TR156 uh, scenario. I'm just skipping through some of these now. So, so that's the kind of flavor of the architecture work that's gone on in the forum now. Now I'll move on to the uh, next generation access customer premise equipment and some of the work that's been going on there. So. Is, is um, TR69, which is a, a CPE WAN management protocol for, for managing 
devices in the home from the DSL router and, and things behind it. Uh, that was, uh, uh, that was developed, uh, and developed and delivered in, in, in May 2004. May 2004. Uh, today, uh, there's, there's today almost 50 there's million, almost million, million broadband lines, lines managed, managed by that protocol. By that so, protocol. So, approximately so approximately 10% of the world's broadband base is now managed by that. Managed by that. Uh, and it came about uh, basically came about because, because people because move from people best effort internet access, access to have things like Wi-Fi and IGMP and all sorts of other bits and pieces in that customer equipment. It became too complex for end users to configure without giving them a huge manual. So the idea was how can you take that pain away and do things remotely. Do things remotely. Uh, so it covers, uh, uh, so it covers also, configuration, also configuration, service provisioning, service provisioning firmware, management, firmware management, diagnostics, and fault and performance monitoring. Uh, uh, and, and the idea and is that that, uh, that remote management uh, ma is managed by an ACS, which is an auto config server. That can manage millions of devices. There are some operators today that literally are managing millions of devices from these things. Uh, and that can be used at every stage of the life cycle of deploying that customer premise equipment, uh, from deployment, installation, management, uh, and in-life support for, for troubleshooting. Uh, and just as, uh, as details of the protocol are in the slides, but we won't have time to go through all that today, but uh, just to give you so an example use case, a customer calls up with a, a problem with their, their equipment, uh, through the auto config service uh, a server, the, the customer service rep can query the device settings, work out, for example, that the firmware is out of date and contains a known bug. Uh, they can request that the auto config server initiates a, a file download to upgrade the firmware. They can decide if they need to change any other configs for that customer at the same time. Uh, the firmware uh, uh, upload is acknowledged by the device and, and goes back to the ACS. Uh, and th this can all be done, you know, with a couple of mouse clicks automatically. And, and there's been a, you know, a number of similar systems to this that have existed. A lot of proprietary systems. Um, I've worked in places where we developed our own. But the idea that this was standardised so that equipment vendors, CP vendors, could build common data models, uh, so you could do this in a much more scalable uh, and secure manner with, with a lot more devices. So that reduces your call center escalation, uh, escalation costs. Uh, costs, your average holding, your average holding time goes, goes down, down, your, down, your, your first time, your first time uh, customer, uh, you know, customer fault resolution, fault resolution uh, times reduced. Uh, times reduced. Uh, and it's really designed uh, it's really to streamline, designed that, to streamline, that, whole streamline that whole management. So as I say, that's been so say, widely that's adopted been in the industry. Adopted in the industry. Um, um, a lot of this work we've worked with other organisations. Uh, most, re recently uh, most recently, the Femto, Femto Forum and 3GPB, 3GPB, 3GPB to come up with a standard, uh, standard data model for Femto cells. Femto cells. We've, we've done work in the past, we've got data models for, for set-top set -top boxes, set -top boxes network, network attached storage, storage. Uh, obviously DSL routers, including Wi-Fi. A lot of work at the moment on data models for uh, different LAN interface technologies, um, uh, power line technologies and so on. So uh, this is just a subset of the data set of the data models that have been produced that, that uh, work in conjunction with TR69. Uh, and rather than just uh, publish paper specs on these, we, we now actually last a uh, few ones of these, we've been, been publishing uh, the entire XML schema as well. Uh, and we've run tutorials on XML so people know how to write these data models and get them to work. Um, so that's uh, all very well, but what does that mean for next generation access? Well. In the early days of next generation access, when people uh, are deploying VDSL2 from the cabinet to get 40 meg or, or G points to the home to get 100 meg, the in infrastructure provider will probably provide the uh, network termination point, the VDSL modem or the GPON ONT. But in the longer term, there's a desire for a lot of ISPs to have a wires only interface so that they can completely um, control and choose the CPE. Uh, an integrated solution, uh, get the price point and the functionality that they want from their pet vendor, rather than have to do what OpenReach tell them to do, for example. So a lot of work we're doing there is to try and drive towards those wires only scenarios, so as ISPs, people have got more choice, and then users have got more choice. Uh, so in future, that, you know, we may get some of these, these next generation access terminations provided by the retail ISP, or maybe one day they'll, they'll appear in Dixon's and PC World. But for that, you need interoperability. Um, it needs to be self-installed, plug and play. A lot of operations and maintenance features to work across that uh, interface, uh, and, and good standards defined in that area. Uh, so that's particularly challenging for some of these new technologies. So a couple of scenarios with GPON here. One scenario favoured a lot in the US is where you have the, the GPON ONT on the outside of the house. Today they have something called NIDS, you know, on the outside of the house to terminate their existing uh, uh, networks. Uh, and then you'd have a separate uh, residential gateway, basically a router. So that's a two-box solution. The other approach is that you can have an integrated ONT and, and the residential gateway, the, the router, all in the same box. 
uh, much more integrated, and that could be on, on the inside of the house. Uh, so depending on which uh, geography and which operator you're working with, there'll be different preferences. Uh, and if you look at a lot of Jeepon vendors, a lot of them have got a, a family of you know, 10 or even 20 different flavors of, of termination unit. Um, some of them are designed for multi-tenancy units with 48 you know, Ethernet ports on for putting a block of flats. So there's certainly not one size fits all. So there's definitely a strong argu argument to have choice there. Um, so the way that this, this could work with GPON is that um, the infrastructure provider who's dug up the road and put in the GPON could manage the GPON physical layer and set up the VLANs th through uh, an ITU protocol no known as OMCI that manages the GPON. But then you could use TR69 that a lot of ISPs use for their DSL service today. You could use that to manage all the higher layer stuff within that same box and have it partitioned. And that way the ISP's got control and defines the service layer. And it's an integrated solution. You could obviously do that with separate boxes, but re really you want to try and do that with an integrated box, uh, which is this slide here. Sh shows you know that all going into the same device. Okay, and if, if you look at the functions you need to do that with, with GPON to deliver, say, triple play, today you can do that with DSL with two DSL boxes. With two a DSL boxes. router that DSL might have route. voice ports on, making it an ID, um, such as an orange live box, an orange for example, live box, for example, and a set-top box. Set box. Uh, with with GPON, uh, with, with I, have GPON I have seen some uh, deployments, uh, some deployments of some trialists, some trialists where they actually put all these functions in discrete boxes. Now, who um, wants who five boxes wants in your home? Um, in your to home. me, that looks um, like a backward step. It's a lot of space, a lot of power, a lot of interconnect to go wrong, a lot of customer calls. All those things in green can be integrated in a single box, and there are vendors out there today who have already done that. Um, but then you um, get into the, get uh, into the and, and, and operators, people and like France operators, Telecom, like France are, are telecom driving that. Are They're saying that, that you know you can put the um, the uh, GPON functionality uh, the on, an on an SFP in the in, in the router and have a single box. So there's a lot of uh, push so to, to, uh, to go in that direction. So there's work in the broadband forum, basically defining the model for how you partition this management in that integrated solution. We've been working very closely with the ITU and FSAN who define the GPON file layer. Side of, things, side of things, and the Broadband Forum the broadband uh, forum. defining all the kind of higher layer stuff. H how do you have a virtual uni in a box? How do you agree on that and standardise it so vendors can build to it? So, so that's been quite a focus area. Uh, and um, the, f the final area, so we've talked a lot about GPON. The other area of next generation access is fibre to the curb, uh, to the green cabinets in the street we have in the UK with, um, with VDSL uh, transmission on the end, so you can get up to 40 meg. Uh, so the work we've, we've been doing there is mainly focused around performance and functional uh, test plans uh, for VDSL so that you can get to this point where you go out and buy CPE and you know it's going to work well and, and plug in and interoperate. Uh, and clearly that can't be just a paper exercise because some of these specs are, are God knows how many pages, incredible detail of test rig setups and how it's going to work. Um, so we actually organize a lot of practical events called PlugFest where we get the vendors in no marketing or salespeople are allowed, it's just engineers <laughs> in a room, uh, usually uh, hosted by the University of New Hampshire. Uh, and we do that for both uh, chipset chip vendors and then vendors system level and vendors, system as well. vendors as well. And the engineers and basically, engineers tweak, basically their tweak their firmware, firmware make sure they understand, sure they understand, the, understand the, the specs and the get these specs, things to interoperate. Things to interoperate. Uh, so that's a quick uh, run so through of the architecture and CP work. Uh, just to uh, summarise, so, uh, next generation uh, access, next generation um, access um, Ofcom have defined Ofcom this term defined active this line term access, where access, somebody like OpenReach like or, or other construction other providers would put the GPON or the VDSL, the VDSL in the ground, and other operators, cable miners, for example, or others, could come along and interconnect to that at an Ethernet layer in the local exchange or higher up. So a lot of the broadband forum work on architectures, on CP management, and, management in and interoperability, interoperability is basically, is basically uh, underpinning, uh, some, underpinning of that, uh, some of that, uh, that ability to, ability get, more to get more competitive service provider service involvement in that, in that, uh, uh, that area. Uh, that uh, area. Uh, and that's where I think uh, often that's why they, they join the broadband forum to try and drive, drive some of those standards forward, forward quickly. Um, the, the broadband um, the forum broadband work forum itself work is itself broken down is into broken three down areas, three management, areas, management, network, and, and network user. And uh, user. So uh, all these technical so reports technical are grouped into one of those three pillars. Those three pillars. Um, the current um, the state current of the art is, is uh, broadband, suite uh, broadband suite three, three which, which was finished at the end of last year. That covers the architecture I've talked about, various bits and pieces of CPE management. What we're trying to finish off at the moment this year is sub-release 3.1, where the key things we'll be working on next week, as a meeting next week, 
meters is to try and finish off this finish VDSL, off this 2, VDSL work, 2 work, get that published, get and that's, published, taken, that's uh, taken a huge amount of uh, effort, uh, uh, effort uh, uh, to define, uh, particularly uh, the performance points. For some reason, vendors get very nervous when you set the bar high on that, particularly the chipset vendors, but we're nearly there. So that should be out before the end of this year. And then in terms of future releases, there, there's work going on in IPTV, on best, IPTV practice, best practice, uh, DSL quality, uh, DSL quality, management, quality DSL management, DSL management, DSL line management, etc. Et the next major the release, next release for, release for uh, hopefully will come out towards the last part of next, next year, which is that will be the first uh, architecture and CP uh, management, management, management reports that include reports IPv6. That include IPv6. Uh, and there's also work uh, going on on energy efficiency, fixed mobile convergence, and some of the new home networking technologies as well need to drive interoperability there. So that's a, a bit so of a, a, a whirlwind a tour of some of the work that we focused on next generation, next generation access, access. That's just one that's element. Just as I say, element. there's as work as on fixed mobile, mobile convergence, convergence IPTV, IPv6, 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 all that kind of good stuff. But good stuff. there's no way we get time to cover that in 30 minutes. But if you'd like to find out more information, the URL's up there, and or feel free to grab me. I've got to disappear soon after lunch, but I'll be around lunch for a little while. But there any other questions we can't answer now? I don't know if we do Q&A now, do, do, do we, Keith? Yep. So any, yep. any questions? Any questions? Nope. Okay. No questions for Gavin. Okay, thank you very much for that. Have we managed to sort the echo issue on the webcast? That's just what on the webcast. Sorry, uh, for those of you in the room, there's an issue on the webcast with some kind of audio echo, so we're just trying to fiddle and make that go away for the remote participants. <laughs> Do we know how many people we've got on the webcast at the moment? I don't know. Um, um, saying something? Saying something? Testing? Testing? Will is using the white noise, using generator. white noise generator. <laughs> um, is that any better, Tom? Um, Do you need me to continue, continue talking complete nonsense? Talking well, nonsense. Um, while, we're uh, while we're trying to sort the audio out, out, I will introduce the next speaker, the which, next is, speaker um, which is Jean-Marc Luzzi, Jean Luzzi from, um, from Juniper. Um, Juniper. Um, um, there's been quite a lot of work going on in the IETF and, and various other vendors. Various We've been doing quite a bit of this work at ISC um, with, a, with a large cable company. In terms of, in terms of my PV6.